Welcome to the debate at GO8 podcast series exploring issues and research affecting the Group of Eight universities and by extension Australia's economy and our society. My name's Ron Candelars, I'm a freelance journalist and producer, and throughout this series we've been canvassing a range of topics, touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. In the studio with me is Vicky Thompson, the CEO of the Group of Eight Universities, and joining us online is Professor Ian Fraser, immunologist and co-creator of the cervical cancer vaccine. Professor Fraser announced his retirement in November 2020 from the University of Queensland. In these podcasts, we've often discussed the game-changing research done at GO8 Universities. Well, Professor Ian Fraser's work has impacted on millions of lives around the globe and has the potential to eliminate cervical cancer within a generation. Not surprisingly, some media outlets have referred to him as God's gift to women. Well, firstly, Professor Fraser, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak to you post your retirement announcement. But let's get our bearings when it comes to your overall career. Take us back to the beginning and your initial work in Scotland. You started as a as a renal physician and clinical immunologist. Is that right? That's approximately correct. I, when I uh, graduated as a doctor, the first five years I spent working in training as a renal physician in Scotland, and the my side interest in immunology was one which emerged from my undergraduate studies. And I understand you came from a family of scientists and medical practitioners. So was it? Career ordained? Do you think you preordained this uh, this move? Was it part of your DNA? Uh, not quite. Uh, when I went to university, I originally went to study astrophysics. Uh, I thought that would be really quite an interesting topic to study, but I realised very quickly that there weren't any jobs available once you completed your studies in astrophysics, and went and went back and started a medical course. So yes, I guess it was sort of preordained that I'd be doing something scientific, mm. but the choice to go into medicine and then immunology was a later one. And that was a very strategic approach, wasn't it? Uh, you know, you deciding the the sort of area that you went that you wanted to go into because you looked at the the job possibilities, etc. So you took this very strategic approach when you moved from work as a renal clinician to work in the field of immunology. Yeah, I think that would be fair enough. I think that uh, I wanted to work in an area where things were beginning to happen rather than in renal medicine where it seemed that at that time there wasn't very much being done that was novel. So that I, I made the use of the move to Australia to basically enable that change of career to focus on clinical immunology because at that time in Scotland there really wasn't a training program for clinical immunologists for doctors with immunological, immunological interests. So how did you come to Australia? Well, Tell us about that story. I came to Australia for the first time as an undergraduate student. Uh, undergraduate students were expected to do an elective somewhere, and I recognised that it might be quite interesting to go as far away from Scotland as I could possibly get. And since I already had my interest in immunology from my undergraduate science training, I was keen to go to somewhere which was recognised as world leading in immunology. And at that time, the Walter and Liza Hall Institute in Melbourne was the place where all of the really interesting new immunological papers were being published from. So I wrote to the Walter and Liza Hall Institute and they passed me on sideways to the Royal Melbourne Hospital. But I got a three month uh, period working with an immunologist in the Royal Melbourne Hospital, studying antibodies to sperm after people had had a vasectomy. It didn't come to a publication, <laughs> but it certainly got me to Australia. And in 1985, you took up a teaching post at the University of Queensland and continued your work on human papillomaviruses and cervical cancer. Your research, along with that of the late molecular uh, virologist Dr. Jean Zhao, led to the development of a vaccine which prevents infection with HPV and cervical cancer. Take us through how, how you came to that amazing breakthrough? I came back to Australia after I had graduated and done my training in renal medicine to work at the Walter Meiser Hall Institute in Melbourne again. Uh, and then was fortunate enough to work with Professor Ian Mackay. His interest was uh, largely in autoimmune disease and uh, I sort of branched out from autoimmune liver disease to virus-induced liver disease because what I was really interested in was how we defend ourselves against virus infections. At that time, the flavour of the month in virology was, of course, the emerging disease of uh, HIV-AIDS infection. 
Although at the time that I got into that area, there wasn't actually knowledge that there was a virus underlying it. But I started working on the patients who had HIV AIDS and realized that they were having real problems with genital warts. And that got me interested enough in papillomavirus that I went off to visit Harold Zurhausen in Germany. He was the professor at the head of the German Cancer Research Institute. And I spent quite a bit of time visiting that laboratory. And his major interest was in papillomavirus, so that I basically got a grounding in papillomavirus and how it might work. And that led in turn to a visit to Cambridge, where Margaret Stanley was the lead uh, pathologist working on papillomavirus. And I took that one step further by then collaborating with my then colleague, Dr. Jan Zhu, who was also working with Margaret Stanley on papillomavirus. So the two of us got together and basically worked out that it would be really interesting if we could understand a bit more about how the papillomavirus worked. And that research work led to us developing the vaccine against cervical cancer, or at least it led to the technology that made that possible. Mm -hmm. Because what we really were wanting to do was to build the virus in the lab and in order to build the virus, because we couldn't we couldn't multiply it up in the lab like you do with normal viruses, we decided that we would have to do it bit by bit. And first of all, we thought we'd make the shell of the virus. And we used genet- then relatively novel genetic engineering techniques to express the viral capsid proteins in mammalian cells and monkey kidney cells, in fact. And what came out of that much to our surprise was that if we expressed the capsid protein correctly in the mammalian cells, the protein self-assembled, the building blocks came together and made the shell of the virus with 360 copies of those building blocks without us having to do anything. And when we saw the shell of the virus, we realised that we might have a vaccine. It really is a story of a, the, the, the value of global research, isn't it? I mean, you've mentioned Germany, Australia, the UK... And I think it's a it's a fantastic example of how research is global. It's not local, and you you go to where the best research happens, mm. wherever it, it might happen. But of course, you didn't just then have a vaccine. There's a process that takes place, and in many ways, we talk a lot now about you know innovation and commercialization. And obviously, we'll get to to, to that because it's a massive success story with Gardasil. Um, but there's a huge period of time from from really potentially the time you came here in what 1985 to the time that you actually got to to that endpoint and i'm just wondering just jumping forward a little bit in the current context we're at because we're really at the sort of vanguard of protecting basic research because there's a lot of an impetus for translational research which is important but you don't get that until you start back here with the basic research. And I'd be really interested, Ian, in your views now as a sort of senior researcher in, 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 uh, on a global scale, of your views about that sort of the journey between basic research and the output and the challenges and the handbrakes that we have now in terms of sort of funding and policy and the need for quick, easy wins. Good research is, also, is usually slow research. Mm. I mean, there may be a breakthrough somewhere along the way, but it's a matter of steady progress. And the, the same applies for the t- practical application of that research in the clinical arena. Uh, you, you might think you want to set out to get something done quickly, but it takes a while. The work that I did with Jan Zhu, first of all, in Cambridge, when I was there on sabbatical for a year, was followed up by a further year of relatively... Uh, discovery research in back in Brisbane when I came back from my sabbatical and Jan came with me and the two of us worked together along with Jan's wife Shavi on actually producing the virus-like particles. We took that one step further in Brisbane and I showed that if we used those virus-like particles we could immunize animals and they would make it what seemed to be neutralizing antibody but we then had to go out and find some commercial company that could take on the challenge of taking what we had done in the test tube and building it up to a scale where it could be tested as a vaccine. And of course, that process took from uh, 1991 through to about 2005 to show that we actually that what we had originally set out to be as a vaccine was in fact an effective vaccine and could protect women against developing infection with the virus that causes cervical cancer. So yes, 
right. It's a staged process. Of course, we had to keep ourselves alive during the period between 1981 and 1995. And both of us pursued research careers during that time, which were sort of related to papillomavirus, but much more trying to understand how the virus actually worked in the cell systems that we were using. So we could understand a bit more about how papillomavirus controlled the body's defences against infection, uh, because we were a little puzzled, because here was a virus which you catch it and you don't get rid of it yourself, or at least most people do get rid of it. We didn't know that at that time, but a lot of people couldn't get rid of it. And we really wanted to understand what the virus did to the immune system. So that became the basis of our research for about 10 years until we were able to look forward to the idea that the vaccine that we thought we'd developed back in 1991 was actually effective and was protecting women against infection. So was that a frustrating process, that 1991 to 2005, in terms of of getting it to market in the way that you did? Like, Did you literally have to wear the shoe leather out to, to, to make that happen? Most of that was done in the 90, early 1990s. Uh, when we talked, Jan and I, about the potential of the vaccine, in the international papillomavirus meetings, the people that were there immediately saw the potential that there might be a vaccine, although other people were doubting for a whole range of reasons. And they included people from the major pharmaceutical companies that made vaccines, uh, because there was obviously an interest in cervical cancer and how you might be able to prevent it at that time. So that I went round all of the different companies that had expressed an interest and taught them a little bit about what we had done after we'd filed a patent on it. And then they, in turn, came back to us, and at least four of them were really interested in being involved. But when they found out what the trials had to look like, because at that time we already knew that the vast majority of women who got papillomavirus infection did not go on to develop cancer. They got rid of it themselves, so that the studies were going to have to be very large. And only two of the companies that we talked to really had the wherewithal to take on the prospect of making a vaccine where you'd have to immunize tens of thousands of women to find out if the vaccine was actually effective. So where did we do those and, where did you do those clinical trials? Well, Merck, of course, and GSK did the trials, not us. Yeah. But they were they were done globally. Uh, because, uh, first of all, to accumulate that many patients, you really have to take everybody that you can get in many different centers. And uh, the, obviously, from the company's point of view, the longer that process takes, the more money they're spending without actually getting return on their investment. So that uh, they moved fairly rapidly through the early stage clinical trials to show that the vaccine was safe and produced antibodies in the blood. But when it came to the later stage clinical trials to demonstrate that the vaccine actually protected women against getting cervical precancer, which is a treatable disease, then uh, they found very rapidly that they needed to recruit globally and they were literally taking, I think it took about five years to recruit a sufficient number of patients to satisfy everybody that there would be an outcome at the end of the three-year observation period that was allowed. I noticed that, that, that you have said you were frustrated that the vaccine had to be made in the US. You believe that we could have developed Gardasil here if we had the appropriate facilities. What, what, what facilities are you talking about? Well, we originally licensed the technology uh, through CSL, and I'd kind of hoped that CSL as a vaccine company might have been able to make it. But at that time, they, didn't, they, did, they weren't working on molecularly-based vaccines, and to set that up in Australia would have been desirable but would have taken quite a long time and a lot of money, whereas Merck and GSK were both already using that sort of technology to make hepatitis B vaccines and all that they had to do. And it wasn't a trivial business when I say all. All that they had to do was to take their technology that they were already using to make hepatitis B vaccines and switch over to making papillomavirus vaccines. That took a year or two, but it would have taken 10 years, I think, to get a plant off the ground to make the vaccine in Australia. Now, of course, we could do it in Australia, but uh, then we couldn't. You must be incredibly proud of the achievement, though. After all, your vaccine's gone into the arms of 440 million people across 116 countries, according to the WHO. It's a great success story for Jan and me. And I mean, my big disappointment, of course, was that Jan passed away before we even knew the vaccine worked. But his, his widow, Xiaoyi, is well aware of the 
that and they, we were equal partners in getting the vaccine out there. It's it's really nice to see that it has in fact happened uh, because it, it might have not worked and that would have been unfortunate. It might equally well have worked, but nobody might have used it. And that would have been even more annoying because then we had a technology that worked, but it actually to persuade people to use it required people to realize that cervical cancer was in fact a serious disease and that we weren't really managing it very well clinically at that time. How does the title God's Gift to Women sit with you? <laughs> Uncomfortably, I have to say, <laughs> but better than the one that was in uh, Cosmopolitan magazine, which was the little prick that may save your life. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I hadn't Love seen it. that one. <laughs> but the vaccine is now routinely offered to boys uh, aged you know, 12 to 13 who can also uh, contract HPV. Tell us about that that side of the research work. It's important to understand that, first of all, papillomaviruses cause more than cervical cancer. So other cancers and the cancers in the inner genital region, including anal cancer, which both men and women get, are caused by papillomavirus. And in addition to that, we also now recognize that quite a large part of cancer at the back of the throat or of pharyngeal cancer is caused by papillomavirus infections. So that the Immunising boys obviously protects the boys and it protected them against getting, gen, getting genital warts as well because the vaccine includes two types of papillomavirus that cause genital warts. But more importantly, immunising the boys increases the level of herd immunity. So that if you only immunise half the community and a few people have missed out, they will be at risk of getting the infection, clearly. But if you immunise 95% of the whole population, you break the chain of spread, especially for papillomavirus where on average one person only infects one other person. And so by immunising boys and girls together, you can basically break the chain and eventually, therefore, we'll get rid of papillomaviruses and we may, in some point in the future, not actually even need a vaccine to do that because they'll just be gone. That'd be quite amazing. Mm. Yes, it would be nice to say that we'd eliminated entirely a, a virus. I mean, we've ex we succeeded that for, with that for smallpox. This virus should, in principle, be one that we can get rid of as well. More difficult because for smallpox, you could always see people who were infected. But for papillomavirus, as I say, the vast majority of people who have the infection don't even know they've got it, but can still infect other people. So eventually, it'll just be a case of getting sufficient herd immunity that everybody's been immunized, and then the virus won't be transmissible anymore, and eventually will just disappear. So given the impact of this sort of research, how do you how do you rate Australia's contribution to medical research more generally? Um, are we world leading? Well, we're certainly pulling well above our weight. There's no doubt about that. There's more good research comes out of Australia per head than would be true for most countries in the world. We don't always recognise it as much as we should do, I think. I think we think, OK, well, if the vast majority of stuff, good stuff comes out of Europe and America. And maybe that's true, but then we're only 24 million people and we're in a population of 8 billion on this planet. We're a very small part of the research community, but we deliver well above our weight. How do we, how do we shift that, do you think? I mean, that's, that's sort of my day job, you know, with the, the group of eight universities, given the research that we do do. And, and, you know, if we go right back to the beginning of, of this interview, you know, what attracted you to Australia, apart from wanting to get as far away from Scotland as you could at that point in time, but was because we already had a global reputation at that point in time. And I just wonder, you know, how do we actually lift, not our reputation because our reputation is good, but in the minds of the general population, really, that what we do is, is punching above our weight in many areas. Yeah, look, I think the, the fundamental question that we're trying to address here is the question of how we ensure that we translate the research that we're doing into practical outcomes for people. And uh, traditionally, Australia was extremely good and remains extremely good at doing basic biomedical research. But we have been perhaps less able to do the translation for two quite good reasons. One is that we are a small country and uh, therefore... The, the target population of something that we're trying to get off the ground here is going to be small. And the second one is that we don't have big pharma resident here as much as we should have. Interestingly, the one of the side effects, if you like, of COVID has been that there has been a recognition that we actually have to improve our ability to translate through the technologies of manufacturing here because people are beginning to realise that in times of trouble, 
during COVID, then we couldn't rely on other countries to do our hard work for making drugs. We actually had to be able to do it ourselves. That's right. And we had to build our own that, our own sovereign capability in, in that in that space. Do you think that COVID has been a game changer? You know, a shift in in thinking about that rather than this just in time uh, attitude that we've had in so many areas. Uh, it's now a just in case sort of attitude that prevails. We've we've got to confront some of these things to to look after our population? Yeah, look, it's clear that we need to do that. Uh, the vaccines were point case in point. We couldn't make vaccines here against COVID, and we still can't. We're relying on people from overseas to do that for us still. But it's a little more complicated than that because we actually need to have uh, people with the skill sets that are necessary to do that. And that means that we've got to train a generation of young scientists to be thinking not only about uh, the basic science and the cause of disease, but actually thinking about how you go about taking some product that somebody has already developed in, in the test tube and scaling it up and manufacturing it here. And that in turn means that we've got to find markets that we can sell to beyond just Australia. Because we're as a small we're a small country, but if we could manufacture in Southeast Asia, then clearly the market there is much larger. I note also that you, you, a lot of what we've been talking about, the research you've done, is cancer related. And but you once said that cancer is always going to be with us. Can you explain what you meant by that statement? Yes, I mean cancer is a disease of aging, and uh, the greater burden of cancer is in people over the age of sixty-five. Uh, it's because we're not as good at preparing ourselves as we would like to be. I mean, we, we, we're, we're pretty adaptable as humankind. We, you know, we can cope with a lot of things that go wrong with us. But when it comes to looking after our own genetic information, as we get older, more and more mistakes accumulate. And that's an inbuilt problem because we have an ability to repair ourselves. Cells can divide. And every time we divide ourselves, there's a risk that something will go wrong and we'll copy a bit of genetic information incorrectly. The longer you live, the more likely that is to happen. And eventually cancer is just the accumulation of a very large number of mutations in cells that could would do fine if those mutations weren't there, but have acquired new properties of if you like, immortality and ability to keep going and spreading simply because of the mistakes they've accumulated. So eventually, as we grow older, we're going to have increasing risk of getting cancer. There are some people that seem to be genetically programmed to avoid that risk, and that's really something we should be doing more research on because there are obviously people reach into their hundreds, you know, 105, and don't develop cancer. And when you look, they don't also accumulate mutations in their genetic information so fast. So that in itself is something that we could perhaps select for, but actually working out how to do that would be pretty difficult. I think you just have to recognise that we're going to be faced by challenges with cancer and develop the best treatments we can to treat them once they arise. Can I just take you back to your comment around the, the sort of the, I guess, the, the landscape in Australia in terms of not having big pharma and sort of some of the handbrakes on translation, if you like. And of course, you've been intimately involved in the Medical Research Future Fund, which was a landmark, you know, multi-billion, million dollar fund set up under the previous government to to exactly look at these sorts of issues. And Ian, uh, are you still on the advisory board? I can't recall if you still are or not. Or is that contentious? Yes, I am. <laughs> yes. No, I'm uh, still on. I'm still yes. on the advisory board for yeah. the it's really med- for the medical medical research, research future fund. fund. But my question is not necessarily about the machinations of the fund, because that's another story, Ron. <laughs> Maybe not for a podcast, mm-hmm. but more about the effectiveness, I guess, of that fund in driving researcher behaviour and really putting Australia on the map in terms of our medical research. Well, look, that was certainly the intent when it was set up. It was a clear understanding that we were better doing the basic research than translating it into practice. And uh, the, the, the other side of the story, of course, is that uh, tr- tr- research translation quite often fails. So you had to have a fund where you could take risks. And I think that the previous government were quite recently thought that this was worth investing and put aside eventually $20 billion as the fund to provide the funding to encourage translational research. And of course, that's what it's doing. Basically, there's about the same amount of money now available for translational research as is available for the basics of bioscience research. 
and uh, the the net result of that is that there are a lot more scientists who are now doing translational research, which of course will see the full benefit of that because there'll be more products coming out from that research. We still then have to build the manufacturing capacity and the enthusiasm for making the drugs here to take that the final step, which is where we actually start to return to the Australian economy, the funds that we've invested in the translation of research. Yeah, so that's another interesting point about building that manufacturing capability. And we we talked just previously about a potential side impact of COVID in a positive way. But if we go back to Gardasil and and the, the clinical trials that you needed to do where you needed to do it at scale, is that always going to be somewhat of a limitation in the Australian context because we don't have the scale for clinical trials, and so we have to go offshore to do them. And is that is that where we start to lose some of our our research offshore once we do those clinical trials offshore? Well, first of all, if we're cl- clever enough to make sure we pr- protect what we've done, then we get the benefit anyway if it goes offshore. But the other c- side of the coin is, of course, that it is possible to do clinical trials in Australia for relatively common diseases. But if you've got something which requires very big scale studies like the Gardasil studies where there was ten, tens of thousands of women took part in them, then that's difficult to organise in Australia. And the time is money. You want to get your trials done quickly. You want them to fail quickly if they're going to fail and succeed quickly if they're going to succeed. And so that, that may, may require us to go overseas. In addition to that, we also have now to be well aware of the fact that not all populations respond equally well to particular treatments. And therefore, if you've got a new treatment, it's necessary to test it across multiple ethnic groups in order to ensure that it's as effective in one group as another. I wanted to move on to something else, uh, Professor Ian Fraser. I mentioned before that you had a fairly strategic approach to looking at the area that you would uh, move into as you continued on with your medical career. I noticed that you said in 2019 before COVID struck that you were reported as saying mental health is going to be the biggest challenge in the 21st century. If you if you had your time now to pick a new area to move into in terms of medical research, would it be mental health? I'm, I'm it's because that's not where I was trained. But yes, I think we do need to spend more time thinking about mental health. I mean, the brain is the last organ in the body that we have got some vague understanding of how it works. The immune system is the second last one, but uh, uh, we we still really don't understand what goes wrong with our brain in order to lead to mental illness. And we need to understand that better before we can start to think about solving those problems. Uh, mental health challenges are environmental to some extent, but they're also genetic and they're biochemical. And so we really need to be able to plan to do research programs in that area that will lead to better outcomes for patients that have already got problems and more importantly to try and prevent them happening in the first place. So you see that as the the next frontier in terms of real breakthroughs? Well, I I hope it will be, yes. And uh, it's the big frontier, the big challenge that we face right now is mental health. And what we really need is to think up some really smart ideas about how we can go and about discovering what the underlying problems are that lead to these mental health issues that we see, because they are chronic and by and large, and they spoil the lives of lots of people who would really rather not have the illness they've got. I know that time's sort of uh, against us, but I just wanted to ask you, what does retirement look like for you now? Uh, yes, a good question. I, I think it would be fair to say that it's semi-retirement at the moment. I still look after my students in the uh, university and I'm involved in biomedical research in a number of other ways. But it means more time with the kids, more time with my grandchildren, more time on the ski slopes, more time with my wife going out to concerts and Having a, having more of a social life, having a life, that. yeah. <laughs> but 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 importantly, yes. you did mention you, you you'd still be heavily involved with mentoring uh, younger colleagues at the University of Queensland, obviously. Yes, well, that's obviously something that uh, is in the blood, and I was very fortunate to get a good training throughout my uh, earlier years in science from people who were aware of what age I am now, and I think it's really important to make sure that we. While we're still capable of doing it, we continue that training process to give all the up-and-coming young scientists the best possible advice we can give them about how they should go about their careers. Now, you're very humble. I, I, you know, when I asked you before about 
being God's gift to women, you sort of played that with a straight bat. <laughs> in a mark of respect, the University of Queensland is renaming the Diamantina Institute its immunology research body, the UQ Fraser Institute. How do you feel about that? Well, I, when, when it was first proposed, I felt a little uncomfortable about it. But when I think about what it really means, I mean, it's honouring research, and I think that's good. So I'm quite pleased to have my name there if that helps the process of getting people to get involved in research. And I'm not just talking about doing research now, I'm also talking about funding research because we depend quite a lot on charitable funding for the research work that we do. Now, the papillomavirus vaccine research work was initially funded by a grant from the Lions Medical Research Foundation in Queensland. And uh, the, the, it was at a very early stage in those days, and if I tried to write a grant to the NHMRC about it, they'd have said that insufficient preliminary data. <laughs> so you've got to have that money at that basically comes untied to let you do the best research that you possibly can. Unfortunately, the NHMRC are beginning to shift across to some of their funding coming that way as well, uh, so that people who have got bright ideas can basically pursue the thing that they most wish to do. Well, we've spoken in these podcasts many times about the work that Group of Eight Universities do that impacts on people's mm -hmm. lives. And without a doubt, yours has had a profound impact and continues to have a profound impact. It's been a, a pleasure chatting with you today. Well, thank you for spending the time with me. I hope that uh, we get a message across out there to whoever's listening that medical research delivers. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, please visit our website geo8.edu.au. And a quick reminder that you can always tune in to Debate at Geo8 on Spotify, Google, Apple or YouTube. Bye for now. <laughs>